come and take them. This is probably one of the most famous warrior responses in history to anything. This is what King Leonidas, the Spartan king, said to the Persian king, King Xerxes, at the Battle of Thermopylae when Xerxes demanded that the Spartans lay down their arms. Leonidas' response was two words in Greek, molon labe, come and take them. 2,500 years ago, today, to this month, a detachment of 300 picked Spartan warriors, supported by 4,000 other Greek allies, marched out to the pass at Thermopylae in northern Greece and defended that against an invading army of what Herodotus named two million Persians, accompanied by a fleet of a thousand ships. And the Spartans died there to the last man as they knew they would. But by their sacrifice, they bought time for the other Greek cities and they saved Western civilization. Now, in my opinion, this battle, the Battle of Thermopylae, is kind of the, is the supreme example of the warrior ethos and the warrior archetype in history. And I'll, I'll give you a few reasons why. Number one, if there's such a thing as a good war or a good battle, this was it. It was entirely defensive. Number two, it was against overwhelming odds. Even if we reduce Herodotus' estimate of two million Persians to what the modern historians call 300,000, it was still 100 to one odds. The other thing were the stakes of this battle. What was at stake? What was at stake was Western civilization because had the Persians won, there would have been no such thing as democracy, no such thing as the rights of man, no such thing as anything we hold dear in the West. But the aspect of it that, to me, makes it the supreme example of the warrior ethos and the warrior archetype is that the Spartans knew from the beginning that they were gonna die. You know, if you think about other battles in, in history, each side goes in thinking, well, maybe we can win, or if we can't win, maybe we can survive. But the Spartans knew that they were gonna die. In fact, the whole point of, of the defense of the past was that they did die. They knew it and they went ahead and they did it anyway. Now we might ask ourselves, and let's ask ourselves here, who were these guys? Who were the Spartans? Were they some kind of supermen that, uh, that could defeat anybody? There was a, an exiled Spartan king named Demaratus was with King Xerxes when he came on his invasion. And Xerxes famously asked him, who are these Spartans? Could one of them defeat 10 of my men? And Demaratus said, no, they can't. They're not supermen like that, but 10 of them can defeat 100 of yours, and 100 of them can defeat 1,000 of yours. So let's talk about why that is and how, how the Spartans fought. You know, when you see movies, you see these sword and sandal movies, it's almost always like a wild melee where people are slashing with swords and stuff like that. But that was not what the reality was. The Spartans fought instead in a very dense, compact mass that was eight men deep and with shields in front lapped one across the other so that so that it presented a united solid front to the enemy. Now the Spartan shield went from eye line to knee line so that a warrior staying behind it would be looking just with his eyes over the top of it. They were circular concave shields that actually protected the whole body and half of the warrior next to them. Now here's something to give you an idea of what this is. This is a breadboard from my kitchen. It's made of oak and it's about, you don't know, an inch, inch and a half thick. This is what the Spartan shields were made of, lapped with bronze. Now, if you know what a breadboard is like, an oak breadboard, you could stab this thing all day long with knives. You could whack it with meat cleavers. You're not even gonna make a dent in it. So this thing could stand up to arrows. Arrows might stick in it, might pin cushion into it, but nothing is gonna penetrate this. Spears, javelins, nothing's gonna penetrate this. So. The Spartans would advance against the enemy, I'm gonna put that down on the ground, with one shield lapped against the other, and, and in a dense eight deep phalanx, and they struck overhand with eight foot spears. They didn't stab underhand, they didn't slash with swords, they struck overhand. So the point of this concept was that if these shields could stand up to arrows and stuff like that, they were basically invincible, as long as they held their ground. 
Now, how did the Persians fight? How did they and their allies fight? Not at all like the Greeks. They fought as archers primarily, and a Persian warrior, typical Persian warrior, fought from behind a wicker shield that was this high that they would actually stake to the ground, and they would launch their arrows from behind at a distance from this. And they were not armored, like they were not heavily armored like the Greeks. They might have had a, you know, a leather jerkin or something that they wore, but they weren't heavily armored. Primarily, the Persians and their allies were horsemen. They fought as cavalry, and that was kind of the way it, it was in the East. So, why did the Spartans pick a narrow pass, the Greek allies pick a narrow pass? It was like, like what we're looking at here, where you can look out over the ocean, a big high mountain on one side, a drop off into the ocean, the Malian Gulf on the other side. So the Spartans picked this narrow pass that an army could not get around on either side, and they felt like against these archers, that if they could form a wall with shields that were you know, unpenetrable and just hold it there against these archers and the other attackers of the Persians that they could stand them off for a while or at least delay. And as it turned out, that's what happened, at least for three days. The Spartans and their allies killed, for every man they lost, the Persians lost 40. It was pretty overwhelming in that sense. Now, how were the Spartans defeated? At Thermopylae because they were defeated in the end. And the answer was that although they could hold off a frontal attack, if they got enveloped, if the Persians could get behind them, then they didn't have a chance. And it turned out that they were betrayed by one of their own countrymen. There was of the, the high mountain that was on one side of the pass, there was a secret path around to the back of where the Spartan position was. And Xerxes, the Persian king, had this elite force called the Immortals, the 10,000 Immortals, his absolute creme de la creme of his force. And they, the traitor, led this force around behind. They got behind the Spartans, and, the, and, and uh, that way they were hemmed in, enveloped from both sides, and that was the final day when they were defeated. And there's another great moment that Leonidas seems like he was a quotation machine, but on that final morning, when the Greeks knew that they were being enveloped from behind and they still had about an hour or two to go, Leonidas released the allies and kept the Spartans. The Spartans stayed there to die. And they formed up, one of the great things in Herodotus in the histories was that on the final morning, they dressed their hair so that they could die. They made themselves look as good as they possibly could. And Leonidas' final quote, he called his men together and he said, now eat a good breakfast, men, for we'll all be sharing dinner in hell.